We're so glad you plugged in today online at Cornerstone Church. Each message is designed to strengthen your walk with Christ. However, we do encourage you to be a part of a loving church home where you can build real relationships with real people and grow in your walk with Christ. We hope this message blesses you and we can't wait to see you next weekend. Good morning and welcome to Cornerstone. Good to see you. We tried to introduce you to Southern Gospel this morning. How'd it go? I mean, last night we did it. It was like Pentecost, man. It was something else. We had them up and jumping and dancing, and uh, that's the Gaithers for some of you that don't like. I mean, I think there's only two types of music, Southern Gospel and Southern Rock. Can I get a yee? How about a yeehaw there? Woo! Listen, before we get started today, I just want to talk about a couple things. Um, uh, March the 14th. Uh, will be our first this year annual picnic. We'd love to have you. There's going to be a lot more information coming out. It's going to be at Lake Ashby. We've been there before. We fill the place up. It's a chance for you to get to meet so many people that go to so many different services. Um, if you're here for the first time, second or third time, small building, big church, we're kind of excited what God is doing here. Last week, we almost reached 600 in attendance, and uh, we're, we're always pretty comfortable with that. We're, we know that if you were here last week for the first time, you didn't get a lot of room, a lot of seats. That's because Pastor Mark was preaching. <laughs> but um, uh, we'd love to have you March 14th. Don't know the times yet, but it'll be out on Facebook, Instagram, website, all of that kind of information will get out there. And then secondly, uh, we're doing small groups a little bit different this year. So if you're part of uh, small groups, you have one now, feel free to continue it. If you want to get involved in small groups, um, I'll just make sure that I won't get your attention there, young man, this morning. Just kidding. Um, we want you to continue small groups. Um, FPU is getting ready to launch, Financial Peace University, so we'd love for you to be a part of that. Just go on the website or call the office. Now, that being said, we've always followed a semester system. And that's, that's good. It, it, we like it, but this year we're doing it different. We're going to just go back to the biblical days as often as they met. Amen? Open your homes, and uh, although the big launch will probably take place in March, some of you are already in small groups. Just continue it. Uh, whether it's six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, a whole year, we're excited about that. If you want to be a host home and open your home, then give us a call. We'd love to meet with you and bless you. If you want to be a facilitator, give us a call. We want to bless you. If you're getting ready to start a small group, give us a call. We want to bless you. Just get ready for small groups in the launch. We, we just, we're just not that big of a deal trying to, like, ramp it up now. We're ready. How about you, okay? I hope that you'll get in the small groups and enjoy. You know, Mark uh, talked about fear. We opened up this mini-series talking about the fear of uh, 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 victory over fear, victory over the world. Today we're looking at victory over sin. And I said that there's really only two things that I'm afraid of, spiders and following Pastor Mark. Man, when that guy preaches, he preaches a word. But I'm glad that you're back this weekend. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of John. The book of John, starting in chapter 19, looking from verses 16 to 30. This particular passage, these passages are really about the crux of our faith, and I, and I want us to look at verse 25. I'm using this morning the New Living Translation. You may have one with you. That's where I'm going to use this morning. You may have the New King James or whatever you're using this morning. Now, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clothus, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And now a vessel full of sour wine was setting there. And they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a wonderful day you've given us. We pray, God, that you would open our spiritual eyes, ears, and hearts to your word today. We pray that the songs that have been sung, we pray, God, that the prayers, the meditations of our hearts have been offered up. They've been pleasing in your sight. Now, we ask you to guide us this very hour. Be with each and every person here and the ones in all services, Father God. And touch them in a way that no one else can but by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray as this whole weekend has been so unique, and we're thankful for the salvations from last night to this morning, that there might be somebody here today that would confess Jesus for the very first time. We look forward to, Father God, you moving in this service. It's in his precious name, your son, 
our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And all of God's people say, 2,000 years ago, the, the crucifixion was very commonplace. Uh, 500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, the Persians were doing crucifixion. And then 300 years after the death of Jesus, crucifixions continued. A, a, a guy, by actually the first Christian emperor by the name of Constantine, he stopped it. He put a, a, a stop to it because they were so horrible. And, and so in other words, the Persians invented it, but the Romans perfected it. It was a hideous, hideous torturous way to die. And when John wrote about the crucifixion, thousands of people had already gone through the crucifixion and thousands of people had seen it. They had experienced it. And so because of that, the writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you don't get to see or hear a lot about a, a, a gory details. It's just not part of the, the opening Gospels. Now, when it comes to capital punishment in America, we, too, have uh, punishment styles. You know, there's the electric chair. There's lethal injection. There's, there's um, gas in some uh, states. There is uh, firing squads. And even in some states, there is um, the hangman's noose. That still exists in capital punishment. But nothing is as horrible as crucifixion. What's interesting is when you look at uh, the way we do it today, it's um, executions are private. You know, when there's an execution, a lot of people don't know about it. Um, there's no cameras. People that attend would either be uh, family members or someone who represents the victim. But no one's in the room, no cameras, not a lot of media, but not in those days. When crucifixion was done, it was up close and personal, and you got to see it. And everybody watched it. And the Romans wanted to make sure that you would see it. They, they wanted to make sure you get the message, don't mess with the Romans. And so a lot of people think, too, and <clears throat> when we were in Israel, Golgotha is still there, the skull. Uh, but the way over years it's been built up, um, Mount, Mount Calvary, Golgotha is a little higher. But back in those days, a lot of people think that Jesus and crucifixions were way up in the air. They're not. It's right there in front of you. And so you're talking maybe four foot off the ground when someone was crucified. It was that hideous. It was that um, horrendous because, again, the Romans wanted you to see that. And there's another difference, too. Uh, with, with executions today, they are swift and they are fast. But not in those days. Crucifixions. They meant to go a long time. They, uh, some report that you could be on a cross as, as, as much as nine days dying, and so people would watch that. And so when you think about the Gospels and you study it, sometimes when you're a student, you've got to wonder why isn't there much written in the New Testament. You think about this. The Apostle Paul uh, wrote half of the New Testament. And when you study the Apostle Paul, what you're going to find is, is that in Paul's epistles, you don't see much about Jesus' miracles. You don't see much about his sermons. You don't see much about um, who his friends were. You, you don't see hardly any of that. In fact, the, the, the New Testament, although it speaks about his birth, particularly in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you, you don't get a lot about the, the, the death. But in Paul's letters, you do. When you read Paul, it's something that he actually highlights. It's something that he really speaks about it, and it's so interesting uh, when you think about this. He says, this one thing I do, I preach Christ crucified. If you're a cornerstone, that, that's what we preach, Jesus and him only, amen, and the cross of Calvary. There's another reason for that. The, the death of, of Jesus emphasizes the very highlight of his life. When you think about Jesus Christ and all that he did, this is the highlight, this event of his entire life. When people have been born from the beginning of time till now, all people are born for the purpose of living. But Jesus was born for the purpose of dying. That's what it's all about. He even said this, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Listen, death did not end the work of Christ. It is his work. But what's fascinating is, is if after tons and tons of people who've accepted Jesus and who call themselves Christians, man, if you were to ask some people, why did Jesus die? There's a lot of people who don't know why. There's a lot of people who don't understand the cross 
and Christ. I, I say this often, you can't separate them two. They go together. And so here's what I want you to do. I just want you for a second to take a long look in your mind of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, hanging there on the cross. Because something happened when Jesus said it was finished. And that's what we want to talk about today. question is, what was finished? You see, just as much as we have victory over the world, just as much as we have victory over fear, we also have victory over sin. Can I get an amen? The cross finished that. First of all, on the cross of Calvary, Jesus finished the work by being my substitute or your substitute. Another way to put that is, is Jesus took my penalty because of my sin. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus became my substitute and he became your substitute. He took our place. For what? Well, the penalty of sin. He didn't go to the cross to be some type of example. He was our substitute. Someone said this. We had a debt that we could not pay, and Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe. The cross is all about substitution. It, it means someone takes another person's place. And when you think about Christ, the truth is it should have been us. It should have been me. But Jesus lovingly and humbly gave his life. God leaves the throne room of heaven in the person of Jesus Christ lives amongst us for 30 to 33 years, and there gives his life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever loveth him would not perish but have everlasting life. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. The sinless one died for the sinful one. In other words, the just for the unjust. Maybe another way to put that is the perfect for the imperfect. You understand we're not perfect. There's not a person in this room that's perfect. There's not a single person in this room that's not sinned. Oh, Paul, in his letters, calls us saints, and we are. But we're saints who sin. And there are those who are sinners that are outside of Christ. And I would say today, if you're here today and you've never confessed Christ, you've been baptized, today is the day of salvation. You see, in every conceivable way that I could think of or that I think hopefully you could think of, we're sinners. We're sinners by birth. We're sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice. We're sinners by practice. And the cross, well, it was made for me. But Jesus was hung on there. Now, maybe you're still at the cross of Calvary because, I mean, we came here today, I hope, to worship him, to praise him. In fact, to be at that foot of the cross to recognize all that he's done for us. And so while the Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross, and while our sins put him on the cross, it was his love that kept him on the cross. Amen? He loves us that much. In Matthew's account of the crucifixion, there's a story told that many of you know you've heard it. Jesus cried out. The, 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 the cry was powerful and loud and echoing. Eli, Eli, lama sakbathini, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, at that very moment, you have to think about something. Jesus had never been separated from his father. They were unified. They were one. They were complete. And all of a sudden, he's been abandoned. Abandoned by his father. Why? Well, his father cannot look upon, our God cannot look upon sin. Folks, without Christ, we are in big trouble. I know some of you see that sign that you see coming back from Longwood. I, I get the point why they do it. God's not angry. <laughs> I don't know if that's good theology or not. God is angry. He despises sin. He can't look upon sin. And so he could not look upon his son. And so he sat on his hands basically and turned the opposite way and separated himself because sin is so ugly and death had to be paid. And what is sin all about? It's about the penalty of death. And so when God turned away, he was abandoned. See, see that's, that's what sin's about. Sin separates us from God. In fact, that's what hell is about. It, it is a proximity and a place 
where a sinner without Christ goes. You need Jesus in your life. You need blood covering in your life. You need to have the blood applied in your life. Amen? And that's what Jesus did. He paid the price, became my substitute. You know what's amazing? God predicted it, how the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, would die. Isaiah 53, verse 4, notice what it says. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But his, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've, we've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of all of us. Talk about brutal. Talk about horrific. You've got to get the picture of what Jesus did for you and did for me. Uh, some of you know I love history. I love Civil War history. I found a story here uh, I read years ago in a book that I have on Abraham Lincoln. And it's a story about when Abraham Lincoln died, he was, as you know, taken from Washington, D.C. back to his home. And they had stopped in Albany, and there in Albany, they carried the body through the street. And this is what's report. They say that an African-American woman stood on the curb, and she lifted her son up as, as far as she could reach above the heads of the crowd. And she said to him, take a long look at this, honey. He died for you. Man, you know, if I could... If I could just lift you up somehow this morning above the crowds, above everyone's head, above the world, and you could see what Christ did for you, it would change the way you think and the way you operate. He became your substitute. Number two, on the cross of Calvary, Jesus finished the work of satisfying the law. When Jesus screamed out, it is finished, he was saying what the law required... I have completed, I have done on your behalf. Now, what does the law require of sin? You have to think about that for a second. The Bible says that the penalty for sin, let me say again, is what? It is death. So we deserve to die. But the Bible says in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. I, I get out of your vocabulary. That he spilled his blood. He did not spill his blood. It was not an accident. He shed his blood. It was intentional. From the very moment that Christ was given the authority to head to the cross, it was on his mind. You were on his mind. And blood had to be shed. In, in other words, for, for Jesus to be our living Savior, he had to be our dying sacrifice. He became our sacrifice. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. And when he was hung on the cross, he looked or took upon himself the curse of our wrongdoing. The law says, this is how we love God. We obey the law. There's just a problem with that. None of us have. In fact, I know there's some of you who say, oh, I've never broke the Ten Commandments. I've got bad news for you. You have. And the Bible says if you break the least of these, you've broken them all. You see, we don't know how to obey perfectly. And the Bible says if you don't obey perfectly, you will die. Here's the problem. The law shows us how dirty we really are. Adrian Rogers says it this way. He says, the law shows you how dirty you are, but it cannot clean you up. The law will tell you. To fly, but it gives you no wings. The law will tell you to run, but it will give you no legs. The law will tell you to build, but it will give you no hands. The law exposes your sin, but gives you no way to overcome it. That's the law. Do you remember years ago, you could walk in a kitchen and you could smell natural gas? Some of you remember that, right? You could, you could just smell it. In fact, maybe cooking. Uh, years ago, you couldn't smell propane. Um, it's interesting how natural gas can sneak up on you in those days. In, in uh, 1937, March 18th, in a town called New London, Texas, 
there was a natural gas leak in a school. And something sparked it. And when it sparked, because I couldn't smell the natural gas and I couldn't escape, 293 students and teachers were killed instantly by this explosion. Because they, they didn't see it coming. There was no, there was no notification. There was nothing you could do. And, and, and I remember I was cooking with propane a long time ago. And I had the same problem. I couldn't smell the propane. And I was on the back porch. And I don't know what caused the spark, but whatever it did, the propane blew up. And when it did, God has been so good to me over the years, it blew me over the deck about six foot away. I mean, you would have thought that it was a shuttle coming in for a landing, right? Like the sound barrier. And the, and the grates of the grill were on my neighbor's roof, and I was just laying there deafening. I couldn't smell anything. Of course, you know now the law has been changed. In fact, what they do now is they put a, an odor in natural gas, in propane, and it gives you the warning that when there is something leaking, you better be prepared, right? I mean, here's the, ladies, how many of you have ever dealt with a rotten egg? <laughs> yeah, not a lot of cooks in here, right? How many of you guys have dealt with rotten eggs? Come on, get out, be a witness. There you go. Looks like you're doing the work. <laughs> you know, the rotten egg is a warning. <laughs> get out of the kitchen, right? That's what God was trying to give us. He, he, listen, I, I don't know. I don't know God's mind. It's beyond anything. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. But God knew we'd blow it. God knew that we were going to screw up. And he said sin is so dangerous, so deadly. I'm talking about a holy God. Sin is so bad. And I'm so holy you're going to make a mistake here, and the only way that we can deal with this is if I become the sacrifice. Acts 20, 28, where God gave his life for the church. I've, I love that passage. How could spirit bleed because it was God on the cross? Jesus, the Trinity, the triune, the Messiah, deity, giving his life for you and me, taking my place, and satisfying the law. You see, the law exposes our sin. We can't overcome it. We're just... Sinful human beings that mess up all the time. And so Jesus, being God, did it on our behalf. He fulfilled and satisfied the law completely by giving his life. Paul writes this in Romans 8, verse 3 and 4. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. And so God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control, hallelujah, over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Verse 4, he did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Jesus, God being in the flesh, the only one who ever kept the law, the only one who never sinned, See, all the law did was condemn us, showed us our filth. It showed that we didn't measure up. It showed that we were not perfect, and it couldn't save us. And so the only one that could save us is Jesus. And it says, the Bible says that Jesus comes along and becomes that perfect gift. Romans, Paul writes in Romans 10, 4, For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. And as a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. All who believe, pistuo, to cling to. I know there's people here that believe this morning, but remember, some people are going to miss heaven by 19 inches. Can I get a uh uh-huh? We got a few. We need a Saturday Pentecost again, man. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus finished the work by conquering sin and death. Man, that's so cool. Listen, we don't have to fear sin or death any longer. That grip doesn't have us. Some of you remember Jay Cass, another Southern gospel guy. He said, death is no big deal, but dying stinks, right? That's true. For the Christian, for the one that believes in Jesus, for the one that trusts in his promises for their yes and amen, death is no big deal because it's been conquered. Death has been conquered. Sin has been conquered. We have a funeral service here that will be starting at 4 o'clock. Some of you may be coming. And I'll be doing a funeral service for Lindsay Novovich. Some of you knew her. She was part of Cornerstone. Her husband, Tony, will be here. Their 10-year-old daughter, Isabella. 
She passed away of cancer. I, I will tell you, it was an amazing young woman. And I got to tell you, because she knew the Lord Jesus Christ, death is and was no big deal. I've been at the bedside of many people who are dying, those that know the Lord and those that know not the Lord. And man, let me tell you, for those who know the Lord, their confidence is so strong. Because we just translate, to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. Even Jesus said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It is like that, folks. It happens that fast. And so if you fear death today, I want you to think about that as being a believer in Christ Jesus. Don't let the enemy steal your joy. Don't let the enemy take hold of you and have you fear death. Romans, Paul says in chapter 5, 17 and 18, for the, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who received it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. You know what that means? That means that I have the ability, you have the ability to conquer sin when we turn from sin and turn to the Savior. Now, I say again, whether it's sins of commissions or sins of omissions, this is not uh, omitting, saying you won't sin. We sin. But it does say that we have a Savior who stands on our behalf, the great advocate in front of God. You see, when God sees a believer who is born again, you know what God sees? He sees this beautiful, thin veil of blood that covers, covers us. And when he sees that, he rejoices in that, knowing that that child has been bought and paid for with a price, the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, folks, here's the, the, the booger. I love free will, but I don't like free will. How about you? Because free will tells us we have the ability, the choice to do what we want to do when we want to do it. Yet knowing that we shouldn't do that, we go ahead and do that, and then we break the law or we sin. You say, that, that man, that, that's weird. Listen, Paul, the great apostle, said, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't do, I need to do. Woe is me. I am wretched. I'm struggling. Can I get a witness? But here's the cool thing. We have an advocate. We have a Savior. We have someone that we can go before who intercedes for us day in and day out that sits at the right hand of the Father, and his name is Jesus, and he says, that's my child. They might have made a mistake, but they came before the throne of grace and sought forgiveness through my name, Father, and I paid. They confessed me. I paid the price, and I bought them, Dad. They belong to me. Man, I'm telling you, if you're here today and you've not made that great confession, I, I pray today it is. And if, if you're, listen, if you're sinning and you're outside of Jesus Christ, the grip of the world has you. And it needs to be broken by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're going to make mistakes and we're going to fall. But the cool thing about a believer is, is that we get all them pieces put back together again by Jesus. You remember that old rhyme, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Jesus, I mean, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't put Humpty back together again. See, I got Jesus on my mind all the time. Here, I love this one. Jesus Christ came to my wall, and Jesus Christ died for my fall. He whipped the king of death. He crushed the king of sin, and through his grace, he put me back together again. That's what the Bible says. Don't need Mother Nature. We just need Jesus. Paul writes in Romans 6, 10, when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Lastly, because of the work of the cross, Jesus finished that work by defeating the devil. Now, that's a big deal, folks. He, not you, not me, we don't have enough power to do that. The Word of God says that he defeated the devil. Listen to what Paul writes in Colossians 2, verse 13 through 15. You were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not, not cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. This is the part I like. You might want to underline this in your Bible. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. 
In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Now think about that. See that word in the Bible. It says the record of charges have been re- re- erased. That means he literally canceled your debt. And the truth is, is we all owed, we all owe a debt. But the word of God says because of Christ Jesus, that debt has been canceled. And so no matter who you are in Christ Jesus, the the devil wants to steal your joy. In fact, the Christian tries to steal a Christian's joy by saying, you failed, you're no good, you're unworthy, you keep sinning. Man, I just say, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth, right? Man, God, through Christ Jesus, did the work. And because of that, he canceled your debt. Uh, Paul writes about this in such an extensive way. Paul actually took the concept out of Romans. And if you recall, in the book of Romans, it talks about the debt being canceled. And what's so unique about the debt being canceled, in those days when you left the prison, because everybody has to pay a debt. And so in those days when a criminal uh, had made a mistake and yet the price had been paid, when the prisoner left the, the prison cell, there was either a piece of paper that would be stamped or their hand would be stamped with the word that says teletestia. In other words, what it means is, is that debt has been paid in full. No longer do you need to return. Now, folks, I find that beautiful. I find that so fascinating. There's a lot of people that want to be, I don't know, I guess again, back to the Christian or the, the person that loves to judge other people and say, you better be careful. You made a decision to uh, uh, follow Christ and you've just sinned. You've lost your salvation. That just drives me nuts. In fact, the Bible says that the gift of salvation is irrevocable. Irrevocable. Now, I know some of you want to debate me on that. I'll be glad to stay after service. And just go through the Bible contextually and look at that. Listen, when you go before the Lord Jesus Christ and you seek forgiveness of your sins, the Word of God says through our our sins, which means we missed the mark, our trespasses, which means we're going past the law, iniquities, which means not only are we going past the law, we're just boldly in his face saying, I'm not going to obey you. Yet what's amazing, there's a term Paul uses called repent, repentance. Sorrowful repentance, it, it means, it's a military term, means to turn the opposite direction and head in a new path, a new way. The Bible says when we do that and seek forgiveness, God remembers our sins no more. That's mind-boggling. We tend to remember them. In fact, we tend to help people remember their sins, and we shouldn't. God doesn't remember them as far as the east is to the west. They're just gone. Now, folks, what that tells me is, If you're trying to make a decision today to really live for God, you need Jesus in your life. You can't get to God unless you go through Jesus Christ. You can't go to heaven unless you get through Jesus Christ. In fact, there are some religions that teach that they're this way and that way. You got the Muslims, the Jehovah Witness, the Mormons. You got a whole group of people that say, this is how you get there. In fact, you got stars that say, oh, there's many ways to get to heaven. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ, to accept him. The, the, when Peter, on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, he was on the southern steps, and he was preaching with confidence and power in the Holy Spirit, which we tend to quench, and we should not quench the Holy Spirit. We should allow the Holy Spirit to rise up in us, amen, and to move in the power of the Holy Spirit. Simon was preaching that great message, and he, he preached and says they heard. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So they heard the word, and they were pricked in their heart. And they asked that question, what must we do to be saved? And Simon Peter said, repent and be baptized, all of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, it so clearly says, and I want you to listen to me here, every one of you. The Bible says, not Kevin not some priest, not some reverend. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, if you will confess me before men in this generation, I'll confess you before my father in the next. But if you will not confess me openly before men in this generation, I won't confess you before the father in the next. You don't have to go to Bible college to understand that. 
That means if you're ashamed of me here, I will be ashamed of you there. I didn't write the Bible. The mysteries of God are amazing. I, I was just, we were studying last night and looking at some things in the Middle East. You take a look at that little place called Israel compared to Egypt and compared to Saudi Arabia and compared to Iran and Iraq. And you look at the whole Middle East and God's got his eye right on that little tiny country. And he says, I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse Israel. I don't understand that, but I like blessing Israel. And I don't understand why God says you must confess before men, but I get it. And since he's God and I'm not, he wins. And he says, once you confess him, you're to be baptized. To be lowered into watery graves. It's a, it's a like manner as the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We do the same thing, and we come up out of the water, and Acts tells us in Acts 2.38, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. At that point, the remissions of sin have been covered. It's not water that does it. It's just one of those mysteries. God said it. That settles it, and I'm good enough with it, so I preach it. And it doesn't matter what translation you're in. Those things are clear. To hear the word, to believe, to confess, repent, and be baptized. That's what this moment is about right now. He paid a price for you. He gave his life for you. And if you'd been the only person alive ever, he still would have died for you. Because you can't get to Father. You can't get to God unless you go through Jesus. And Jesus knew that and God knew that. And so it was so important to say, I'm giving my life up. And that's what he asked you to do today, to surrender your life to him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In honor of the person sitting next to you, just... Hey guys, we're so glad you plugged into this week's message. We want to connect with you. Check us out at cornerstonechurch.co. Can't wait to see you next weekend.